Welcome to Wales's other capital, Liverpool. It's a vibrant city that revels in its Celtic heritage. Growing up in North Wales, I felt Liverpool was our city, a place full of opportunity and excitement. The people of Wales have left their mark all over this city. It is a Celtic kingdom in exile. Some earned the respect of thousands of Scousers. Wales has a lot of similarities to, to Liverpool. Sometimes I think of Liverpool as much more Welsh than Wales. And a few played their part in a musical revolution. John Lennon himself had some Welsh connections, and it would be natural in Liverpool. There were so many Welsh people here. We Welsh are a vital ingredient in the melting pot that's Liverpool. A lot of people think it's an Irish city, which basically it is, but it's, it's also a Welsh city equally. This is the story of the Welsh men and women who've helped make this one of the most exciting cities in the world. It's years since I was last in Liverpool, but it's a city I love. For nine years, the Liver Birds was a big part of my life. This is the exact spot, probably the same ferry, where we did the titles for the Liver Birds. I'm coming back to discover why Liverpool is such a magnet to us North Walians and to find out, can it still claim to really be our capital? The Viver Birds was all about the fun of being young, free and single in Liverpool. 40 years on, the city's still attracting young Welsh people who want to broaden their horizons. For me, anyway, I needed that, that bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a challenge, yeah? that, that, a bit of a scary step but Liverpool wasn't that far away, really. It was just two hours on the train. But at the same time, compared to Carnarvon, it's just a completely different world. On the first night, I was just laying in bed and I was like, oh my God. And just even the, the sound outside the window, you can yeah. just hear cars constantly 24 seven. And like back home, it's just a silence with the fields <laughs> around you. I've been here for three months now. And it's just nice having people like Sean and Chloe here that you can just go for a cup of tea and just speak Welsh for like half an hour. I was really scared at first, especially with my Welsh accent, to come here and like speak English every day with everybody. But like it's really gained my confidence, especially like now I'll be going to placement in Western Hospital where I'll be like speaking to patients in English. But I think it will be really nice when, because like there's so many people from Wales coming to Liverpool Hospital like to get treatments and stuff, and it'll be like so nice when I meet someone from Wales that speak Welsh. I really like living in the city. You know, it's, it's just everything you need is here and, you know, the, mm. the vibrancy of it. The young people who come here today may not know it, but they're just the latest chapter in a long story linking Liverpool and North Wales. The Welsh first came to Liverpool by sea. In the 18th century, ships from Anglesey landed here carrying copper, lime, and people. Welsh labourers and stonemasons helped build the city's docks and as Liverpool grew in the 19th century they claimed its construction industry as their own. One man has spent his life recording the work of these Welsh builders. Frank Green is a scouser but like many in the city, he has an intimate connection with Wales. I met my wife at a party in Liverpool, and uh, she, she is from Penagroyce originally. I decided that uh, I had to learn Welsh, so I studied from a course that the BBC ran called Dewch Sharad. I could actually recite the whole book off by heart. Play my Gwen, play my Alino, my Alina in a garage. I was always interested in the landscape of Liverpool. The contribution of the Welsh builders to the, the way Liverpool looks is absolutely incredible. The city faced a crisis in the 19th century as people poured into Liverpool, filling up its damp, overcrowded, old-fashioned houses. Welsh builders seized an opportunity. 
the Liverpool needed huge numbers of houses, these Welsh builders stepped in and actually covered Liverpool in houses in a very short time. The modern terraced houses they built, with their own toilets and running water, offered working people a better standard of life. One of the most famous of the Welsh builders was Owen Elias, who'd arrived in the city on a boat from Amluch, aged 19, with just eight shillings in his pocket. He'd go on to leave his mark on Liverpool. My mother grew up in Neston Street, which is one of the streets built by Owen Elias. Each street started with a letter up from his name. So the, the first ones was Oxton Street, Winslow Street, Eaton Street, and then Neston Street. Put together it goes Owen and William Elias. They reckon that he covered the whole of the slopes of Everton from Hayworth Street to Great Homer Street with artisan dwellings and was known as the King of Everton. As builders like Elias pushed the boundaries of the city ever outwards, Welsh Liverpudlians followed them. Wherever they settled, the heart of their community was the chapel. It was a place of worship, a business club and a labour exchange. When young Welsh men came to Liverpool to find work, the way they did it was to go to these chapels and at the end of the service go on to the elders of the church and say, I've, I've come to look for work. Where are you from? What's your name? And then they would talk to each other and say, oh yeah, so-and-so will take you on tomorrow morning. The thrifty, sober, hard-working Welsh chapel-goers soon prospered in Liverpool. By the 1860s, the Welsh were such a force in the city, they built this chapel here in Prince's Road. At the time, it was the tallest building in Liverpool. It advertised the fact that the Welsh had arrived. At the end of a Sunday night, you'd see about 2,000, 2,500 Welsh people walking up and down the boulevard of Princess Avenue, demonstrating their uh, success in Liverpool, their power in Liverpool, and uh, that they were really here to stay. The Liverpool Welsh must have been so proud of this magnificent cathedral-like chapel. And now how sad to see it fallen into such disrepair. As a major port, Liverpool has long been home to a thriving retail trade. When I was a young girl growing up in North Wales, the big treat was to come to Liverpool shopping. My mother used to bring me here to get new school uniform and a good winter coat. The city has attracted both Welsh shoppers and entrepreneurs. One of the biggest was Owen Owen, whose store became a Liverpool institution. Hey, but it's a cracking shop. You know, a good store, no one orders. I used to go to the disco there on the top floor um, in my younger days. It was absolutely brilliant. It sold everything. I mean, it was a really pleasant store. It was very to go good in for fashion. fashion. Yes. Very good. It was just part of Liverpool, Emma Owen's store, and everyone was gutted when it went. The shop drew throngs of Welsh customers, including Owen Owen's great granddaughter, Lisa Raw Rees. It was so smart. It was just such a lovely store, uh, full of, of, uh, of beautiful things. And uh, an enormous treat was having a knickerbocker glory in the restaurant. Owen Owen, who was born near Machantleth, arrived in the city in 1868 at the age of 20. Well, he was by himself, very daunting at that age and he wrote on his very first night on of his arrival um, what, what was in his mind. He's, he wrote, Be honest to my customers and just to my creditors. This will give confidence. Time being money, therefore waste none. For now is the time to work, read and make a fortune. Do not frequent theatres, music halls, or anything to the neglect of business. 
The shop he opened on Liverpool's London Road showed he had a sharp eye for the retail trade. The window was crammed with goods, all manner of, of drapery, and every single item would have a ticket on it. And he, he just wanted to be sure that he was offering the very, very best price and that that would be passed on to the customer. He also had a paternal concern for his staff, many of whom were Welsh. Owen Owen was the first businessman in Liverpool to introduce half-day holidays for his staff. If they were sick, he would uh, send them to his country house at Penmine Mall. He ended up founding a charitable foundation for um, which still to this day cares for all of the ex-employees of the Owen Owen Company. He was an exceptional man. While figures like Owen Owen made a fortune in the retail business, Welsh printers were turning Liverpool into one of the most important centres of Welsh publishing. Bill Thomas's grandfather ran the printing firm of Thomas Brothers & Co. I've always had a feeling of Welshness, particularly we used to always go on holiday to Wales. When I travel back into Wales, I always get a feeling that uh, it's just strange that I'm, uh, I'm coming home. This picture here is uh, of the Thomas Brothers & Co's annual picnic. The first one shows the building, which was um, in Everton Road. There's a, a horse-drawn carriage. On the side of the, of the carriage is the uh, notice saying Thomas Brothers & Co annual picnic. Bill's grandfather and his business partners had a lucrative sideline in Welsh postcards. These are uh, prototypes for the manufacture of postcards which were then uh, sold by the company throughout Wales. They've all got the, the Welsh humour in them. Uh, of course, the traditional landfair PG. Uh, there's another one, Welsh takes some picking up. And they're all um, painted and they, they would then be converted into postcards. It's quite fascinating to see them. When he wasn't printing postcards, Bill's grandfather played an active part in the sporting life of the Liverpool Welsh. This is a handbook relating to Liverpool League Football Club. Now, my grandfather, Tide, was um, a vice president of the uh, Liverpool League Football Club, so it shows here. Liverpool League were founded by the, the Welsh in Liverpool. Um, they played at a ground in Anfield. Then it gives the colours of the club, which is surprising in a sense, because it's white shirts with blue pants. Uh, I would have thought it had been something more than more the, the Welsh colours. It's dominated by Evans, Griffiths, Owen, Parry, Richards, Roberts, Williams, Thomas. We're taking 30 people, uh, at least or more, to run the football teams. And that's, that's just the players. And then on top of that, so the Welsh in Liverpool at that stage must have been very strong. This is a city that's football mad, and both local clubs have a strong Welsh following. But one in particular has a special relationship with North Wales. Match day sees a tide of Welsh fans flow into the city. Among them are father and son Raymond and Bob Roberts from Conway. The gang of us come here in 1946 to watch England play in Ireland. Uh, it was an international, the first international after the war. And I've been coming here uh, ever since. We bring a bus up here every week with uh, between 30 and 40 supporters. Um, and some, some weeks we have to run two buses. Everton's always been our team, like, you know. There's always been an, an, an a kinship to North Wales, yeah. to, to Everton, Everton, more than yes. more than to Liverpool. I think the Liverpool sports jumped on the bandwagon in the 70s when they were doing well. Well, yeah. And that, that, that's how it stemmed from them. Yeah. It's not just Welsh fans who are drawn to the club. Wales has given Everton some of its star players. Neville Southall's got to be up there amongst yeah. them. Kevin Ratcliffe is another one. Um, and he, even Dai Van Den Howe, when he had the... When he, how, how he got into play for Wales, I don't know, but he was... Uh, he was the heart and soul of this club as well. Yeah. One of the greatest Welsh players to take the field for Everton was T.G. Jones of Connors Quay. Well, he was a Welsh international. 
He was one of the best centre halves Wales ever had. Even at Everton, he was he was christened the Prince, Prince of Wales. Of Wales. <laughs> <laughs> well, I played against Tommy Jones because Tommy Jones played in Buckley in the fifties, and uh, he, he was playing for Everton when I used to come up and watch Everton. I saved the penalty from him <laughs> and pen him out because <laughs> the, the pitch was on a slope and I went the right way for it and I saved the penalty from him. That's my highlight in life. <laughs> Another Welsh Evertonian who was handy in goal arrived in Liverpool shortly after the 1981 Toxteth riots. My manager from Berry drove me here, and as we drove through the city, it was on fire because they had the Toxteth riots on. So we came through, and some of the stuff was still smouldering. And I thought, well, that's really nice, really, isn't it? Because they've actually, that's what you call a proper warm welcome, isn't it? Liverpool proved a bit of a culture shock for a young man from genteel Sandidno. Things are 100 miles an hour. You know, everything's going on, everyone's got somewhere to go, everyone's trying to do this, everyone's trying to do that, and it's, it's just a really fast paced place. And I think, you know, me coming from, I didn't know. It did take a little while to adjust to everything. Can he do it? Great stop by Southall. How often the Everton fans have had reason to be grateful to their goalkeeper. And Luckily, Neville wasn't the only Welshman at Goodison Park. Myself was there, Rats was there, Mickey Thomas was there for 10 minutes. So we, we, we had a few Welsh players, Pat Man and Al, sort of half Welsh. So we, we had a few Welsh people that they could, they could hang out to that. And I think it gave us an identity in Wales, being from Everton, it gave Everton an identity in Wales as well. Give me the opportunity to play in front of some of the biggest critics in the world and satisfy them. And when you get the affection of the people, oh, you, you can't buy that. You have to earn it. And I think, yes, you can get medals, but you can't buy people's affection. You can't, pay, you can't buy people's respect. You have to earn it, and, I th and I'd like to think that I earn the respect of the people, because they've certainly got mine. I think Wales has a lot of similarities to, to Liverpool. You know, we've, we've all been down, downgraded by each government, and we've, we've all had to fight for what we need. You know, we look at them as different countries, but sometimes I think of Liverpool as, as more Welsh than Wales. <laughs> Bearing in mind this is a city that's hosted the Nationalist Devot three times, it's no surprise it's long been dubbed the unofficial capital of North Wales. Some would have argued that that was the case back in the 1960s when Liverpool was home to a thriving Welsh community. My father used to say very strongly and argue with his family that he had a Welsh existence in Liverpool, which they could never have in Wales because there was so much activity going on here. David Marion, whose father was from Blaenau Festiniog and whose mother came from Patagonia's Welsh community, enjoyed a lively childhood in Liverpool. There were five branches of the earth here, Elwittis, and they were very active. There was a big Welsh club down in Upper Parliament Street in, in Toxteth. We had Stedwoods in the chapel. We also ran a football team. When we had our best team out, we were brilliant. The only trouble is half of them used to go home back to Wales at weekends every, every other weekend. And uh, every now and again, we'd be struggling to find Levin. I mean, it was a very active life. I didn't have time to do any schoolwork. I was an academic failure. On top of the distractions of the Esteddfod and the Eird football team, at school there was the thrill of an exciting new music scene. This is Corriban School. This is where I had my secondary education for quite a few years and a very happy education, I can say, as well. The school, of course, is famous as where John Lennon was educated. I knew Lennon fairly well. We were the same year right through school. And, um, well, for the five years before he left and went to the college. But even after that, you know, I still knew him and met him. The first Woolworth in Britain after the war to open was round the corner in Penny Lane. And he discovered that there were these wonderful counters with open sweets, pick and mix. Lennon? I'll shut up the birds who's in charge. You lot go down the other end and fill your pockets. And I didn't go back into Woolworths for about three years after that. Now the 
the Quarrymen, which was his first skiffle group in those days, was named after the school, Quarry Bank. And there were five of them. And of the five, two, in fact, at least, had a Welsh connection. There was Eric Griffiths, who had moved to Liverpool from Henshan uh, when he was three or four years old, and Rod Davis, who was the main instigator of the group. Even the most unlikely Liverpudlians have Welsh roots. John Lennon himself had some Welsh connections, and it would be natural in Liverpool. There were so many Welsh people here, most people had Welsh or Irish connections. Two of John Lennon's great-grandparents were indeed Welsh. There were once well over 50 Welsh chapels on Merseyside. Now there's just one left in Liverpool, the heart of the Welsh community, Bethel. We had to come to Liverpool to get a job. You know, we couldn't get jobs in Wales. So we came to Liverpool and a crowd of us came and we had a, we had a lovely time here. Being Welsh means a lot to me, yes, always has. I was brought up in Anfield and I would say there were at least four Welsh churches, you know, within a short distance. But we have become the only Welsh church now. I come to Bethel because it's the family church. My grandparents came here, my great-grandparents came here. It's a small group of people, but we feel like such a family. It does worry me about the future because this place means so much to me and the people mean so much to me, but people only last so long and we need more people to take it on. I mean, Jenny was here today and bring little Kerry with her. So that's lovely as well, to sort of see the generations. But most of the kids have moved away from Liverpool, so obviously they don't come here very often now. We haven't got that influx of nurses and doctors and teachers that there were, uh, say, in the 50s and 60s now. Uh, students are a bit more keen to go home at the weekends, or if they are studying, they may well go more to Cardiff than Liverpool, which in my generation, uh, 40 years ago, uh, you know, North Wales was a, uh, Liverpool was a great attraction to, for students from North Wales. One of those who came to Liverpool in the 1960s as a young teacher was Ivor Griffith, now leader of the chapel choir. I was amazed how large the congregation was, both evening and in the morning about 600 in the morning and the same in the evening. And that huge chapel was more or less filled morning and evening. Ivor was one of hundreds of Welsh teachers, doctors and nurses who flocked here during the 60s. At that time, it wasn't that easy to get a job in Wales and it was a custom at the Bangor Normal College to just put lists on the board for people looking for jobs. And if you put a name, your name down for a large authority like Liverpool, Birmingham, London, you were more or less uh, guaranteed an interview. And that's how I came to Liverpool. Never been to England before, so coming to Liverpool was quite a culture shock. The days when the chapel rang to the sound of 600 Welsh voices are long gone. But for those who remain, their sense of Welshness is as strong as ever. The final destination on my return journey to Liverpool is a neighbourhood full of relics of the past, which also offers a glimpse of the present and potential future of the Welsh in Liverpool. This road, and ten others like it, are known throughout Liverpool as the Welsh Streets. 
They were built by skilled Welsh craftsmen back in the 19th century. Over a century later, they've fallen into disrepair. When I was working on the liver birds back in the 1970s, they demolished whole streets like this. Terribly sad. Some of the houses here are still well maintained and occupied and give a glimpse of what the area must once have been like. One of them is home to Nathan Jones, a poet from Wrexham who's been in Liverpool for 17 years. Different politicians passing through have tried to regenerate them in different ways and people have got different opinions as to how that should be done. Uh, and it's just been left so long now that I think it's sort of embarrassing for anybody who might want to actually do something about it. A lot of us have been active in trying to make sure that the houses which are livable and you know, would be a great place for people to make, make a home, get regenerated, you know, while some of them are clearly going to get knocked down. Since leaving Wrexham, Nathan has found his niche in Liverpool's cultural scene. Some equivalents of theatre, and I recall, the coming of victory is in key oppositions. The, the community, community of seeing... It's not like living in a Welsh city and um, an English city. It's just like living in towns or cities of, from the northwest. Politically, it's, it feels like I've stayed in the same sort of territory, um, you know, which has been subject to the same kinds of changes over the years. I've lived in this particular area of Liverpool now for probably, you know, eight years. And, you know, it's really special to me. I really feel like we've managed to put down roots here in a way that maybe um, it's made possibly to do with like the depopulation that's happened. And there is a sense of like togetherness that me and my family have been able to like forge you know, like over the last few years, particularly around the Welsh streets, which I'm grateful for. Uh, you know, especially as I get older, I can see that, like, that's something to value. In the shadow of the old Welsh Liverpool, yeah. Nathan and his partner Nina are now raising the next generation of Liverpool Welsh. They kind of know about their history as from being, you know, that I'm from North Wales uh, and Nina's family are from South Wales. So, I'm pretty sure, like, as they become aware of nationality and what that means as part of their identity, um, it'll, it'll come up and, you know, I'm sure that they'll be proud of it. Coming back here, I've felt sad seeing so much of the city's Welsh history now neglected. But what's really struck me is the contribution the Welsh are still making to the living fabric of Liverpool. I love the city and I love Liverpool and I love the people and their humour and their uh, friendliness. When I'm in Liverpool, I think all the time of Wales. When I go back to Wales, I look forward to going back to Liverpool. I'm proud of being Welsh, but I'm grateful to Liverpool for adopting me as one of its own. And I'm not alone in that. Three centuries after we first landed here, the Liverpool Welsh are still going strong. Our Real North Wales season continues tomorrow at 7.30 with a visit to Butlelli's Wakestock Festival. And at 8.30, we've more from the farmer and the food chain.